All right. Well, we are rapidly coming to the close of the Threads uh, study that we've been doing here. We've got this week uh, and two more, two more Wednesday nights that we will will have uh, before we break for the summer. So hopefully this has been really helpful for you, like we've talked about all along, that this was just helping you learn how to put the Bible together, how to read it, um, how to understand a lot of what God is doing, how to recognize patterns that you see in Scripture and what those patterns are supposed to emphasize for us. And uh, so hopefully all those things are, are what you're getting from this, as well as thinking through how do we apply these, right, so that they're not just content, they're not just good information, right? We're not just collecting and storing data, but our understanding of what God is doing and how he has crafted his word is is helping us to learn how to engage our world with the truth of his word, right? Uh, Because we can go into the world, but if we don't go with the truth of the gospel, right, we don't go with the power to see lives change. So this is important for us to to be learning this and know how to apply it in our own lives and apply it to the people that we do take the gospel to, right? The people that we are, are discipling, like Pastor Chad was saying just a few minutes ago. So hopefully this has been really good. Well, let me pray for us and then we'll jump in tonight, okay? Father, we pause tonight and we thank you for this time. Thank you for this place that we have to gather. And God, thank you uh, for the reason we have to gather together tonight, uh, to open your word. God, we, uh, God, we believe your word and what, it's, what your word says about itself, that it is living and that it is active and it has the ability to transform our lives. God, we are seeing that uh, come off the pages of your word as we have journeyed through it uh, through this semester. And so God, I pray that tonight would, would accomplish the same thing. I pray that most of all, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher tonight, that you would reveal truth to us from the word. And God, that it would not only um, fill our hearts and our minds, but God, that it would conform us more and more into the image of your son. So we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so tonight, marriage. We're gonna look at marriage. And every time I think about tonight, I immediately go to one of my favorite movies in, uh, of all time, right? And I, I get myself in trouble every time I tell you one of my favorite movies because then you judge me. Uh, and I think back, it's like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have told you I like that movie. It's not very uh, pastoral, right? Um, but this one may be okay, I'm not sure. Princess Bride, who's seen it? All right, so there's some other heathens in the room besides me. That's good. Um, but remember, Mowage. Mowage is what brings us to Gava today, right? That is what I think of when I think of this word. So I had to get it out or it's going to be playing in my head the whole time tonight. So marriage. We're looking at this thread and we're going to chase it like we have every night. We're going to chase a thread all through scripture. And I don't think I can promise you that I will get quite as animated as Jason did last week when we looked at the righteous sufferer, okay? I don't know that I have that in me, um, but I think I'm pretty excited as I've prepared for for this one. So who knows? We'll we'll see what happens here as we go along. But man, I'm excited to to talk about what, what scripture has to say about marriage and how we are to view and understand this deeper meaning of this marriage institution that God has given us. So, So we're going to do that tonight, okay? So here's the thing, big statement right up at the top. The Bible story is told in terms of Yahweh's marital covenant with Israel. So this will help you as you begin to read, especially as you read the Old Testament, to understand that so much of the Old Testament, so much of the language that God uses, so much of the message that he he gives to Moses to communicate to Israel, so much of the message of the prophets when they are coming to the people of Israel and to the people of Judah with these words, it is all, it helps us. I think it will help you tonight to understand that it all is to be understood through this 
Jewish covenant of marriage idea. So we're going to see that, and you will see kind of the outline we're going to follow tonight right under that statement. So I'm not going to take time to read it for you, but just know this is how we're going to track tonight. So the first thing I want you to see is marriage as a covenantal creation ordinance. Right? When we think of marriage, obviously we would probably think, if we know our Bibles, we think of Adam and Eve, right? And that God instituted marriage in the Garden of Eden, correct? When God saw Adam and he said, it's not good for the man to be alone, right? And so he made Eve and, and he told them, right? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Fill the earth and subdue it. All of those things. We would say, well, yes, the first marriage between a man and a woman. And we see so many things in Genesis 1 and 2 that help to frame our understanding of this human relationship of marriage. And that is good and that is right for us to do that, for us to understand marriage and to define marriage according to Genesis 1 and 2, because that is God's design for marriage between one man and one woman, that they would come together as one flesh, right? And that they could be used by God for his purposes as husband and wife. Right, so that is the plan since the very beginning in the garden, pre-sin, pre-fall. That is the plan. So it is right for us to see that. But I want you to understand tonight, we're going to move on from that to say, let's look at an even deeper thing because we use this word. You even may have heard this in a wedding ceremony where you would say the covenant of marriage. Have you heard that? These two people are entering into a covenant relationship. Now, we may throw that word out, but we don't always think through, what does that mean, right? What are the implications when we say a marriage covenant? I want us to see that tonight a little bit here because there's other places in Scripture in the Old Testament where we see covenant language, where God, God cuts a covenant with someone or a group of people. And the first place we see that outside of the garden is with Abraham. So I want you to see a connection between two verses here in Genesis chapter two and Genesis chapter 15. Listen, Genesis two, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, that's Adam, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh at that place. And then what happens after that? Adam wakes up and he says, Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? She shall be called, whoa, right? No, woman, right? That, that's what we see here, right? It's like, oh my goodness, she's gorgeous, right? She's beautiful, right? Guys, we should all say that when we see our wives, right? But now look at Genesis 15, verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Remember what we've been talking about when you see similar language through the Old Testament, right? As a good reader of scripture, we're supposed to say, wait a minute, I've seen that phrase before. I've seen this idea in other places. This is one of those examples here where we're to understand Moses is wanting us to see marriage is a covenant, Right, just like God institutes a covenant in this Genesis 15 passage that I've given you here, it's the beginning where God is, is cutting this covenant with Abram to say, I am going to make you a great nation and from your descendants, you know, I'm gonna give you a son and through him, right, through his seed, through that line, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed, right? This is the beginning of what we would say is the Abrahamic covenant, right? And how does it begin? With Abraham in a deep sleep and God working. Then we see Adam, right? Adam in a deep sleep. And when he wakes up, there is Eve, and there is this covenant relationship between the man and the woman, this covenant of marriage. And so we're meant to see marriage as this incredible covenant. That's what he wants us to understand from there. But now look at Matthew chapter 19. You'll see that verse there where Jesus is speaking. And he says, have you not read that he who created them, talking about God, right, from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So Jesus looks back at this and he says, listen, listen, these words, right, this, he sees attributing that statement that was made in Genesis, right, in Genesis chapter two, he's, he's, he's taking that statement because those are the words of God and God is doing something something here, right? This was not just a covenant for Adam and Eve, 
but this is a covenant that they are to recognize that have implications for all people, right, at all times. This covenant of marriage is going to be a big deal, not just for how God designed the world to be filled with his image bearers, like we have seen when we looked at the thread of creation, but we're gonna see so much more about why, why God at the very beginning created this covenant of marriage is because there's something he wants us to see. There's something he wants us to understand about himself and about our relationship with him that he wants us to understand through this understanding of what marriage is, this marriage covenant. So that's what we're gonna look at, but we see it starts in the Garden of Eden with a covenant. But now let's move forward and let's look at marriage and this idea of that it is about spiritual fidelity or spiritual faithfulness. Moses talks about marriage, right? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, correct? So he's crafting this, right? He wrote the creation account, right? And now he's writing here in Exodus as well. And he picks up this marital imagery, this language, right? And And he makes it a metaphor, right? This physical human relationship And he says, listen, I want you to picture that, but as you picture that, I want you to think of it in terms of your relationship, talking to Israel. I want you to think of this in terms of your relationship with Yahweh. I want you to associate the two, marriage between a man and a woman and the relationship between God, Yahweh God, and you as Israel. Listen to what he says in Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. He's telling the people, you shall not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is what? Jealous, is a jealous God. Otherwise, you might what? Make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice and you might take some of his daughters for your sons and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods and listen, cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. Moses is using marital language and what is he saying to Israel? He says, listen, Right? If you stray from the covenant relationship that God has has instituted with you as his people, then we're going to look at that more here in a minute. He says, if you stray from that, he likens that to what? Adultery. Right? That I mean, he I mean, do you think God wants us to get a picture here? That their idolatry is the same thing as we would say about adultery in a marriage. So this text functions on that assumption, right? And so it wants us to look at something like that, just like a spouse in a marriage, the covenant between God and his people Israel, Yahweh and Israel are to be faithful to one another, just as husband and wife are to be in a marriage. They are to be Yahweh and Israel. They have responsibilities to one another. If we were to look at the covenant that God made with Moses, right, you could say that's the Mosaic covenant. You could also say that is the Sinai covenant where God has brought them out of Egypt, takes them to Mount Sinai, and there he gives them the Ten Commandments. If we were to go back and read that and we were to take our time going through that, I think you would see, now that I've given you the clue, I think you would see marriage language, marriage vow language in those passages of scripture because God says things like, I will do this, I promise this, I will do this for you, you will be my people. And he says, and and you must do this, you must be faithful to me, you must love me with all of your heart. There is this covenant that happens between God and the children of Israel, right? The Mosaic covenant is a unique covenant. It's not like the covenant God made with Abraham and it's not like the covenant God made with David and it's not like the covenant we see in the new covenant, right? This is a conditional covenant that says, God says, I will be as the bridegroom. You are my bride. I am going to promise to be faithful to you, to provide for you, to protect you, to care for you. And I require you to be faithful to me. That's the covenant language that's there. So there's responsibilities, there's privileges that they are to share only with one another. Do you see that in that Exodus 34 passage? God says, this, this idea of worship and this idea of love that comes as, you know, love is, the, is we can tell what we love by what we worship, right? What we worship is what we love, what we love is what we worship. 
And he's saying, listen, those, those, those things are reserved only for us within this covenant. You're not to go out and worship or love another God. That's idolatry. That's adultery. And he says, Israel doing what they should only do for God is, is adulterous. And so as we then were to read the Old Testament, do we see example after example where Israel strayed from their covenant relationship with God where they chased after idols, right? And we would say, man, why can't they get it together, right? They're, it's, you know, they, they keep straying, they keep straying. But then we read later, right, where God is, where God brings judgment on his people and we go, wow, that's harsh. <laughs> but I want you to think what Israel was doing. When you think about it as a marriage relationship, what they're saying when they chase after idols is Yahweh, I needed more than you could provide. I wasn't fulfilled by your love as the bridegroom. I needed something else. Remember how we've talked about the fact that that God is jealous, right? We read that in the Exodus passage that God says, I am jealous. And we think of jealousy so many times as as a negative thing. But I want you to understand it is right and it is good for you to be jealous for what is yours. Jealousy becomes a sin when you are jealous for something that isn't yours. And so when God says he is jealous for us, when he says he is jealous for Israel, that is good because they are in a covenant relationship with one another. And God says, you are mine. Right, I have brought you out of Egypt. I have redeemed you and you are my people. And I am jealous for you because I can provide for you like no one else can provide for you. Right, I can love you and care for you and protect you and give you everything that nobody else can give you. So I am jealous for you. And Yahweh is not jealous for them because he needed them. He's jealous for them because he knows they need him. It's it's this beautiful picture that we see here. But this idea that as every time Israel strayed, right, for the nations around them that would look at them, they would say, well, your God must not be that great of a God if you have to go chasing after other gods. So do you see what a big deal Israel's actions becomes when you look at it in, in terms of a marriage relationship, it's a huge deal, right? If we were to look in Deuteronomy chapter four, we would see it again, right? Where, where it says, where, you know, Moses is giving a warning in Deuteronomy chapter four, and he says, listen, you know, if you go into the land, right, your, you father children and children's children, and you remain in the land, if you act corruptly and you make an idol in the form of anything and you do evil in the sight of the Lord, Right, he says in verse 26, I'll call heaven and earth to witness against you today. Right, he says, I'm gonna call witnesses to see what it is you're doing. And he says, and when you do, you're not gonna stay in the land for long. I'm gonna drive you out, right? And you will be utterly destroyed at the end of verse 26. And he says, listen, verse 28, and I'm gonna send you away and there you're gonna serve those other gods, right? And the works of man's hands, wood and stone, that neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Now think about the character and power of the God that Israel has been serving. Think about everything they saw him do in Egypt. How he cared for them, how he spoke, how he led them, right? How he was alive and active, right? He led them in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, right? And he says, listen, if you forsake me, and you turn away from me and chase after these other gods, I'm gonna give you what you want and you're gonna ha- I'm gonna send you away and you are gonna go ahead and serve those gods that you think are so great, right? These gods of wood and stone that are dead, that can't do anything, right? So there's this warning that he gives them in Deuteronomy chapter four that kind of predicts what's coming that we see throughout the Old Testament. So we can fast forward to the prophets, because if we were to read on from Deuteronomy and we go into Joshua and then Judges, we start to see it, right? 
time after time, chasing idol after idol, and God trying to draw them back, right? As a loving bridegroom, as a loving husband, drawing, trying to draw his bride back to himself, but every time their idolatry or their adultery just gets more rampant, right? Every time, and so God, God is patient with them, but we see as we get into the prophets that God sends a warning. He sends warnings to them. And so I want to, we're going to see a couple, three of those here in the little bit of time that we have together. I want you to see in Isaiah, because God has called them within this marriage covenant to be faithful. But when Israel is not faithful, God uses a language that maybe we haven't seen before. Maybe you've not picked this up before in Scripture. God calls Israel to be faithful within the marriage relationship. And then when they're not, we get to Isaiah and Jeremiah and God tells Israel, I'm divorcing you. Look at it here in in Isaiah. I'm not gonna take time to go through it, but, but you can see what Isaiah is doing all through the book, how he's prophesying the judgment that is coming on them for their idolatry, for them turning away from God and breaking the covenant relationship, the Mosaic covenant. They have broken it, right? They have treated it as though it didn't matter. And so when we get to Isaiah 50, right, Isaiah's built this case. Here's what you've done. God says, here's what I'm going to do. And we get to chapter 50 and look at what he says in verse one. Thus says the Lord, where is the certificate of divorce by which I have sent your mother away? Verse two, why was there no man when I came? When I read that thinking of this marriage relationship, man, it's it's heartbreaking, right? Here is Israel. They've been chasing after these other gods. They have have broken the faithfulness within the marriage covenant, and they've chased after other husbands, if you will. And God says, when I showed up and looked around, Where's your husband? Where's the one that you ran to for provision? Where's the one that you ran to for protection? Right? Where's the one that you ran to for love? Like, I'm here. Where did he go? The answer that we get from the silence is all of their chasing after other things has left them empty. It's left them broken. And God is saying here, listen, I am divorcing you. You walked away from this marriage. You have continually walked away from this marriage since the very moment that I instituted it. Since the very moment I instituted and and entered into this covenant marriage with you as a people, Israel, you have been walking away from it since day one. And he says, so we're divorcing. This, This covenant is now broken. And he says, I'm gonna send you away into exile. But you need to understand something here. The the certificate of divorce that Isaiah is talking about, right? That he's saying, "I I am ending this covenant marriage with you. It's the Mosaic covenant. It's the covenant that God made with them at Sinai. Because what we're gonna see as we go forward without giving too much away is God is going to be faithful to the covenant that he made with Abraham that from the seed of Abraham, he is gonna bless all the nations of the world and he is gonna create a people for himself that would display his glory in the entire world. God is gonna be faithful to that covenant that he made with Abraham, but he's saying to the people here in Isaiah, he's gonna say it again in Jeremiah, I am divorcing you. This covenant is now, it's null and void, the one that I made with you at Sinai because you walked away from it. You broke this covenant. You were unfaithful to me. But he will keep the the Abrahamic covenant. And we'll see how he's going to keep it. He will keep it through the covenant that he made with David. That through the line of David, there would be a king who would come. Who would be a forever king. Who would sit on the throne of David. Who would triumph and have victory for his people. And whose kingdom would be a forever kingdom. So God says, I am going to be faithful to my covenant, even though you were not faithful to me within this covenant that I have made. So you see the the, the way the covenants all work together. God makes this covenant with Abraham. 
that says, I am gonna do this work through you. And then he gives the Mosaic covenant and he says, until the king comes, right? Until the king comes, here is a covenant relationship. I am going to marry you as my people, Israel. You are my people. I am, pull, I am setting you apart and I am going to marry you. And this marriage is intended to keep you, right? To hold you, to protect you, to guide you until the Messiah comes who will then usher in this new covenant relationship, right? So God is gonna be faithful to that, right? And so what he says to Abraham, he says to David, hey, I'm gonna keep that covenant and it's through your line, David, that there's gonna be a king who will come, who will accomplish the very thing that I've promised all through the Old Testament scripture. So that's how we see these covenants working together. Galatians three and four, if you wanna understand how Paul sees that, Galatians three and four is a great place to go and look where he says, listen, that Mosaic covenant, the law, it was intended to be a schoolmaster to just guide you until the time that Christ appeared, right? That was the purpose of it. So all that's there for you to read, we've got to move on. But I want you to see something powerful here because we're gonna see language here in just a moment in Isaiah chapter 54 that shows the heart of God. Because in Isaiah 50, we see the judgment of God, right? I'm gonna divorce you, right? I'm gonna send you into exile because you have been unfaithful. And we think, where is the love of God, right? We're seeing his justice and his judgment and his righteousness here. Well, guess what? Those are all attributes of God. He is holy. Right, so to see those is is not like, oh my goodness, why would God be that way? God has every right to be that way. But if we think about what's happening in Isaiah, we see in chapter 50 that because of their adultery, they have walked away and God says, I am gonna divorce you. But then that language where he says that, he says, but listen, remember we saw this with Pastor Jason in, in Isaiah 52, this language of a new exodus where he says, I'm going to divorce you and then I'm going to exile you. I'm going to send you away. But Isaiah 52 says, but guess what? There's going to be a new exodus, just like, the, just like in Egypt where I brought you from a foreign land. I'm going to do it again. After I exile you, I'm going to bring you back. So Isaiah 52 shows that. And then we see how. In Isaiah chapter 53, where we see this picture like we saw last week of the suffering servant, right? Of Christ who has come to suffer. How will this new exodus be accomplished? It'll be accomplished through Christ coming as the suffering servant who will come to pay the price for the unfaithfulness of the adulterous bride. The suffering servant is coming to pay the price so that we can read the language of Isaiah chapter 54. It's this beautiful flow that shows what God is doing here. Look at Isaiah 54, flip the page. Israel is in this state as we see in verse one, he calls them the sons of the desolate, right? Their sin has broken them to the point that they are desolate. And he says, but listen, He said, God says, I'm gonna do something. And you who are desolate, the ones I have divorced, the ones I have exiled, but then I have brought back, he says, you who were called desolate, you are gonna be more numerous. And then in verse two, we see language just like in the Garden of Eden. He says, you're gonna enlarge your tent and stretch out your curtains of your dwelling. You're gonna lengthen your cord and strengthen your pegs. This is like fruitful and multiply kind of language. God says he's doing something fresh and new. Verse three, you'll spread abroad to the right and the left and your descendants will possess the nations. You'll resettle it, resettle the desolate cities. What does that sound like? The language with Abraham, right? From you, I'm gonna make a great nation, right? You're not even gonna be able to count them. They're gonna be like the stars in the sky or the sand along the sea. That's the language he's saying here. Look at verse five. He says, your husband is your maker. I thought he had divorced Israel. Now he's calling himself them his, calling himself their husband again. Look at the parallel statement with that in verse five. Your husband is your maker and your redeemer is the holy one of Israel. God did divorce them. The exile is is supposed to be this visible picture of God divorcing them for their unfaithfulness. 
But then he brings them back and he remarries them in this beautiful picture that we're gonna see, right? That God says, I'm going to bring you back, right? And I'm not going, we're not going to try to fix the Mosaic covenant that was broken, right? That's over, that's done. But there's gonna be a new covenant. And in this new covenant, I'm going to, you need to see this as though I am going to remarry you. I'm gonna bring you back to myself, right? I'm going to be your husband. I'm gonna bring a bride. I'm gonna create a bride from the seed of Abraham that I'm gonna bring to myself, right? And I am, and I am going to marry you again. You're gonna be my people. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Ruth picks up that language, right? I've given you some scriptures that you can go and read. Who is the Christ figure in the book of Ruth? Boaz, he's called the kinsman redeemer. What does he do? He steps in and he provides for the desolate, destitute, poor, helpless Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Right, he steps in as the kinsman redeemer who provides and cares for them. And a beautiful picture, right? God says, I am your redeemer, the holy one. He says, like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, but, but in verse seven, but just for a brief moment, but with great compassion, he says, I will gather you. He picks up that language again in Isaiah 62. He said, it's no longer gonna be said of you that you're forsaken, right? It's no longer gonna be said of you that you are desolate like it had said in chapter 50 and in chapter 54. He says, but now your new name, when I marry you again, he says, your name, your new name is gonna be my delight is in her. Isn't that incredible? Don't you just see the grace and the mercy and the love of God? That he says, listen, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you away, but it's just to get your attention because I'm gonna bring you back, right? And then people are gonna see that my delight is in you, in your land. He says, your land, it's gonna be called married. Verse five, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Are you seeing that God wants us to understand the relationship in, in this picture of a marriage? It's pretty clear, isn't it? But it gets clearer. Look at Jeremiah. We see the same thing. Look at verse eight of chapter three. He says, and I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I have sent her away and what? Given her a writ of divorce. And it was meant to get the attention of the Southern kingdom. It was meant to get the attention of Judah, but it really didn't, right? Because it says she played the harlot also and she committed adultery with stones and trees, right? We're meant to see just the silliness of their wandering away. We're meant to see they had so much in this covenant relationship with God. Why did they, why did they let it all go for stones and trees when they had the maker of the stones and the trees and everything else? But they leave. Verse 12 Go, he tells Jeremiah, and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return, faithless Israel. Return, declares the Lord. But they don't. Jeremiah picks up on language in, in his prophecy that ties you back. You can write this down in your notes. I didn't put it in there, but it ties to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses one through four. And in that section of scripture, we have in the law, in the Mosaic law, the divorce law. And that gives the qualifications for how you were to go about um, giving a certificate of divorce. And in that section, it says, listen, if you, are to, if you as a husband give your wife a certificate of divorce and she goes out and she remarries, and then that husband passes away, right? Or he gives her a certificate of divorce, right? If she's no longer married to her second husband, it says it is an abomination for her to return and be married again to her first husband, right? That is, that's, that, that's what's written in Deuteronomy chapter 24. But in Jeremiah chapter 31, God says, but that's exactly what I'm going to do for you. 
He says, I married you. You were unfaithful, so I divorced you. And you ran and basically joined yourself in a covenant relationship to these idols, right? And I exiled you, right? And you were desolate and and you were destitute, but I brought you back, right? I should not marry you again because it is an abomination, but, but God's love triumphs even over their wickedness, even though he says it was, it was shameful and it shouldn't be done. God says, that's my mercy. That's my grace. I'm gonna do it anyway, right? I'm gonna love you that way. I'm gonna love you so extravagantly that I will bring you back even though the law says I shouldn't. I'm gonna do it because that's who I am. I'm gonna love you. I'm gonna I'm gonna pay that debt so that I can bring you back to myself. Look at chapter 31, verse 31. He says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, right? We're not going back to the Mosaic one. I'm gonna make a new covenant with you. That's how I'm going to institute this marriage with you a second time. It is through a new covenant, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the days that I took them by the hand and brought them out of Egypt. No, it's not that kind of covenant because it says they broke that covenant But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they will be my people. Jeremiah 33 continues, look at verse 26. He says, I will restore their fortunes and have mercy on them. You see what God is doing here? This prophecy is saying, listen, Israel, there is coming a day where I'm gonna bring you back to myself, right? And I'm going to restore and I'm gonna make a new covenant with you. I wanna spend just a couple of minutes in Hosea, right? I know some of you may be familiar with Hosea, some of you may not, and that's okay. Hosea is a tough story. Oh my goodness. And when you stop and you think that God actually called Hosea to really do the things, this is not like a made up story where there's some fictitious guy named Hosea, right? And this is just a story that's written for dramatic effect. No, Hosea is a real guy. And God really told Hosea to do the things written in this book for Israel to have this picture in front of them of what they have been doing. Right, they are meant to see in this messed up, painful, like awkwardly embarrassing life of Hosea, they're meant to look at that and say, I'm Gomer, right? That's me, that's what they're meant to see in this, but we need to follow the story for just a minute because it's meant for us to look at this. Look at what Hosea one in verse two says. God tells Hosea, go, take yourself a wife of harlotry. Right, from the very get-go, Hosea is not marrying someone who eventually turns to harlotry. He goes, no, go marry this harlot. Right, you already know what she is. I want you to marry her anyway. Right, and he, and, and, and he even, look at what he then goes on to say, and I want you to have children with her. And here's what I want you to name them. Name the first child, your son. Name him, verse four, Jezreel. You know what that word means, Jezreel? God scatters. You know what Israel would have known about Jezreel? They would have remembered, we read about it in 2 Kings chapter 10, but we read about a battle where Israel is defeated and they are scattered. There's also a battle that this is talking about that's prophesied where it will happen again, where they will be at Jezreel and they will be so defeated that the Assyrians take them into exile takes the northern kingdom exile, right? So you think God is, is, is wanting Israel to understand something by what they name, what Hosea names his first son, right? Every time Hosea's son walks through town, hey, Jezreel, hey, the Lord scatters, hey, you're the, you're the reminder of this horrible battle where we were so sorely humiliated and defeated. God says, I want you to name your first kid that, but I want you to have another child. You're gonna have a daughter and I want you to name her Lo Ruamah, which means I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel. So we have two kids, the Lord scatters and the Lord has no compassion, but have a third child, Hosea, you and Gomer, name this child Lo Ami, which means you're not my people. (laughs) 
I mean, pretty tough picture, right? Oh, here comes Hosea and Gomer and their three children, right? God scatters, God has no compassion on us, and God has what? What's the third child? They're not his people, right? I mean, that, that he, you see what's happening here? And then we see that Gomer leaves. She, if we were to read through the scripture, after Hosea goes and gets her and marries her, she runs off back to prostitution, right? She actually ends up marrying someone else. But you know what God tells her, tells Hosea? Go get her. Go get her. But don't just go get her. He says to buy her back. Like it costs Hosea something, right? Not just his pride, right? Not just pain because he loved her and, and she, she was unfaithful to him, but right? He actually then, he had to pay to get his unfaithful wife back but all mixed in through this language, right? There's this language of judgment. I want you to name your kids these things that are meant to like broadcast to all of the nation about what I'm getting ready to do because of your unfaithfulness. But in the midst of that, in Hosea 1, he says, listen, verse 11, I'm gonna gather you, right? They're gonna go from the land, but I'm gonna bring them back, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna forget my promise that I made to Abraham, Hosea chapter two says, that I'm going to remove the name of these false gods from their mouth, right? And, I'm, and, and, and it's coming a day where I'm gonna make a covenant for them. And then look at the language there. I've underlined some words for you to pay attention to. He says, I'm gonna make this new covenant for them with the beast of the field and the birds of the sky and the creeping things on the ground. And I'm gonna abolish the bow and the sword and war from the land, Right? This new covenant that God says he's gonna make with them on the other side of this. What does that language draw your mind back to? The Garden of Eden, right? This is creation language, right? He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this new covenant that is going to eventually bring about this garden-like state and place for us to dwell together. He says in verse 19, I will betroth you to me for how long? Forever forever, right? And how will he do that? I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in loving kindness and in compassion. And I'll betroth you to me in faithfulness. Guys, we're meant to understand this is our, we're gonna see this in just a minute. This is our bridegroom, right? As, as the church, as the body of Christ called the bride of Christ, we are meant to see, look at the character of the groom, look at the character of God who has brought us back to himself. He is faithful and compassionate and loving and righteous and good. And then we see when he brings them back, right? He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you back. I'm gonna have a new covenant with you. And when I do, look at verse 22. He says, and the earth will respond to the grain, to the new wine and to the oil, and they will respond to Jezreel and I will sow her for myself in the land. The opposite of scattering, right? He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sow her, right? For myself in the land. And then he goes on, right? That's, that's a reference of, hey, I'm redeeming child number one. Child number two, I will also have compassion on her, right? Originally, it's no compassion. Now it's compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, child number three, you are my people. Do you see the redemption that's going to take place in the new covenant where God marries, he, he enters this new covenant, this new marriage with his true bride? Look at the restoration and the healing that it brings. Right? And we would see, we're not gonna take time to do it, but you could go back and read uh, chapter three of Hosea. I've underlined some important phrases for you there, but I've already kind of captured the, the narration of that. So we're not gonna take time to go there. But that's that picture, right? We're meant to understand from the prophets what God is doing when he sends these messages of judgment, right? I am divorcing myself from you, from this covenant that I made at Sinai with Moses. You were unfaithful, it is done. Right In the midst of telling them it's done, he, he gives promise that there's a new covenant coming where he is going 
to do something even better, right? And I want you just to understand quickly, because we're gonna go through this super fast, but I want you to understand when we read the Song of Solomon, right? We don't spend a lot of time there in group settings, do we? Because if we were to sit and read this together, it could get a little uncomfortable in mixed company, right? Because there's some pretty intense language, right? Like the language of lovers in this book of scripture, right? And we would read it and we would rightly read it to say this is a beautiful picture of a marriage, right? Of this intimacy that exists in a marriage relationship. And that is a good and that is a right way to read it. But I think there's a deeper way for us to understand this, that in the new covenant, right? This covenant that God made with Abraham, that he says through David, through the line of David, the Davidic covenant, right? There is gonna be a king who's gonna come, who will be the bridegroom, who will come for his bride. And when he does, and when he marries his people, there is going to be such a marriage. There's gonna be such an incredible, intimate relationship that the bridegroom Christ has with his bride, the church, right? The true seed of Abraham, all those who place their faith in Jesus, right? That's how we're meant to trace this seed, right? He says, when that happens, there is going to be this beautiful marriage. Song of Solomon helps to picture that, of just the intimacy and the beauty of, of, of the marriage that we are meant to see of us being the bride of Christ. And there's language that we can't deny. And in Song of Solomon, chapter three, Solomon as king, as the king is approaching the city for his wedding to get his bride, it says, as he does, there are clouds of smoke, right? Remember, got to pick up familiar language. What led the children of Israel by day? A cloud of smoke, right? It says that when the king is approaching the city, not only is there a cloud of smoke, it says he's being carried on a litter and it goes into a description of what he's being carried on with two poles and, and a box sitting on those two poles. It, 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 it can draw our mind to the Ark of the Covenant, right? Approaching the city. But, and the reason we can even see that is because of the materials that this litter that the king is coming in on, right? It, it's made of the same things the tabernacle was made of and the same things the temple was made of. These fine materials are what are used, right? So it's meant to show us that. And then he enters into the city to get his bride. He's entering into the covenant, this marriage with his bride. Chapter four talks about then with his bride. It talks about the fact that they're naked and unashamed. When's the last time scripture talked about people being naked and unashamed? In the garden, in a pre-sin state. And then later in chapter four, the relationship is consummated and it actually begins to say the bride herself is the garden of Eden. There's this amazing picture through this, this, this picture of the king, the groom who is a king, coming for his bride. And when he sees her, the love that he has for her, right, as he has come for her, it's an incredible picture of love for sure. But when we think of it in terms of, this is also a picture of in the, this new covenant relationship that God is doing, when he comes as the bridegroom for his bride. How rich, how intimate, how beautiful do we see our relationship with him through, through these verses here. Psalm 45 picks up on some of that language. You can read that one for yourself because I wanna look on into the New Testament now, right? Because Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, I even think Song of Solomon are pointing us to the fact that there is someone who's coming who is going to usher in a new covenant, a new marriage, right? And this, this one who is coming is a king who will sit on the throne of David and he is going to do what the old Mosaic covenant could not do. Right? He is going to redeem a people and bring them out of slavery and bring them out of bondage and marry them and bring them to himself. So we're to understand the Old Testament pointing toward that. And then in Matthew chapter nine, Jesus gives a parable talking about the attendance of the bridegroom. The disciples came to John 
I said, why did the Pharisees fast? Well, before we get to the parable, that's in 25, but look at chapter nine. Why did the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom can't mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. How does Jesus refer to himself in Matthew 9? The bridegroom. He says, it's me. I've come. They don't need to fast right now. This is a wedding, right? I've come for my bride. This is not a time for mourning. This is a time for celebration because the bridegroom has entered. He stepped into time. He's referring to himself in that way, that he's come in to enter into this new covenant, this new marriage. Matthew 25 is the parable where he talks about how the kingdom of heaven will be compared to 10 virgins who took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom, right? Five of them were prepared, five of them were not. This picture shows that that this parable introduces Jesus as a bridegroom who has come to inaugurate this picture of his kingdom, this kingdom of heaven. We could flip over to another gospel and look at John chapter three, where John the Baptist is talking, right? And he says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. As John the Baptist is saying that, he's indicating He's talking about Jesus, that Jesus has come and he's come to enter into this covenant marriage with his bride. Who's his bride? His people, the ones who place their faith in him, right? He he who has the bride has the bridegroom, right? He who is the bride, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. We We are the bride. It's a beautiful picture. We are meant to identify Jesus as the fulfillment of what we see in Jeremiah, what we see in Isaiah, what we see in Hosea, this one who is to come, who's going to restore, who's going to take desolate and bring life, right? Who is gonna take those who were shamed and say, I'm gonna marry you and I'm gonna delight in you. Jesus, we're meant, the gospels identify Jesus as the one who's come to do that. And I love this, I've been wanting to, I've gotta do this. Even if we don't get to everything, we've gotta do this part. John chapter four. One of my favorite stories in the gospel of John, Jesus with the woman, where? The woman at the well. I want you to think, we've been talking about marriage. Think about in the Old Testament. Who did Moses meet at a well? His wife, right? When Abraham sent his servant to a well, he went to get a wife for Isaac, right? When Jacob went to a well, who did he meet there? His wife, right? In the Old Testament, right? The the well must have been where you went to, you know, to meet your wife, I guess. I don't know. But we see this picture, right? Of you, they went to the well to meet their wife. Well, now here's Jesus, who's just been introduced in chapter three as the bridegroom. He's at a well. But not with a Jew, with a Samaritan woman. Right? The the horror of it, right? How could, how could Jesus be there with her? But I want you to think about this picture. John has already said Jesus is he's the fulfillment of these, these prophecies that said the, the bridegroom is gonna come. And now here is Jesus, just like these Old Testament figures, right? These, these patriarchs and these, these, these forefathers of, of the Jewish faith and this heritage, right? Who met their wives at the well. Now here Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom who has come for my bride, but my bride are not just the Jews. My bride is anyone who will place their faith in me. Even the Samaritans, even the Gentiles. Isn't that good? You'll never read the story of the woman at the well the same again, will you? When you think about the fact, wait a minute, Jesus was just introduced as the bridegroom and now here he's come, right? And he's not gonna enter into a a physical marriage with the Samaritan woman, but we're talking even something better than that, right? He's going to marry her in the sense of bringing her into his forever family. The bridegroom has come. And oh, what what a relationship that that we will have with him. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 5 where he talks about the relationship with husbands and wives and and a husband is to love his wife with his own body, right? Verse 31, he goes on to say, but for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they will become one flesh. This mystery is great. But he says, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. 
Yes, is it good and right for us to think about how to have healthy, God-honoring marriages here? Absolutely. We should spend as much time as we possibly can, men, learning how to love our wives as Christ loved the church, right? Ladies in this room, learning how to love your husbands in a way that honors Christ, right? And shows, why should we do that? Because of the picture that it paints, because of the deeper significance that exists in marriage, right? I gave you a quote there for you to look at. It's right, it says, the best art is the one that points to the real thing, right? The best human marriages on the planet are the ones that point to the real thing, that point to this unconditional love that we can have in a marriage relationship, right? Where, where the groom loves his bride and will lay down his life for her and, and the bride out of her own choice, right? Not because she has to, but because she chooses to, says, I am going to love you and respect you because I know that you have nothing but the best of intentions for me and you will provide for me and you will care for me so I can trust you and I can submit to your leadership because I understand your character. So I am choosing to submit to you because it shows the relationship between Christ and us as the church. Those are the best marriages, because they point to the whole reason we have the institution of marriage. If we get right down to it, that picture of a human marriage is to point to the relationship that God wants to have with us as his people. So when scripture talks about it, we need to see that. And I just bet if more of us saw this deeper, richer meaning of marriage, you know what I think would happen? Our human marriages would be much more rich, much more fulfilling when we understand every day as we interact with our spouse that this is an opportunity for me to be a reflection of the bigger work that God is doing in the world to share the gospel with all of humanity. I get to show that and declare that through my marriage, if God has blessed me with one. Such an incredible opportunity and picture. In Revelation, I wanna call your attention to something to see after I catch my breath. Um, there's two pictures, the language. We, you've seen, we've drawn you some of these charts before as we've gone through these threads where we have seen language that's repeated in two different places in scripture. Well, we see this in Revelation, right? We're introduced to a figure in Revelation who is called the whore of Babylon. But we also see the bride in Revelation. I want you to see the language between these two. You can see it here between Revelation 17 and Revelation 21. Then one of the seven angels talking about this unfaithful one, this whore of Babylon, Right, and then talking about the bride, then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls, who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues. Look at this next part. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality. Revelation 21, come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. It says, and he carried me away in the spirit to see that, and then it says about the bride, he came and he carried me away in spirit with this prostitute into a wilderness with the bride to a great and high mountain. And it says about the prostitute, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and 10 horns about the bride and it showed me the holy city. Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance most like, like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. Similar language, stark contrast, amen, of what we see between these two. Here we see with, with this prostitute, right? We see the unfaithful. We're meant to see this person. This is, the un, this is the unfaithful, right? The one who ran to prostitution, right? Rather than staying faithful 
to Christ, ran and prostituted herself, right? Fell for Satan's fake trinity, right? The dragon, right? The beast and the false prophet, right? We see all of those in Revelation. We don't have time to get into it, but right? But here's this false trinity of Satan, right? Who pretends to, to rise from the dead, but they didn't die. This false God didn't die for anyone, but we see the the groom, we see the bridegroom who lays down his life, the lamb who lays down his life for the bride. Satan's does not, right? We, we see that there. He didn't die for anyone, but Jesus laid down his life for his bride, right? We see this prostitute sacrifice everything for this hope of fulfillment that she would get from, from prostituting herself, but we see it leaving her empty, right? She exchanges it for what the world offers and she gets nothing, but she gives everything to get nothing. Christ offers everything to his bride. So even in, in the book of Revelation, we see this incredible image coming out of our relationship with the bridegroom. Right, in this picture that's gonna take us, right? John's looking forward into you know, what is to come, right? Pastor Jason spent time in Revelation right here in this room in recharge, right? So, we're, so we've thought about what the end will be, what this new you know, being with him forever in heaven will look like. Well, this picture of Christ coming for his bride, right? The Lamb of God who has laid down his life for his bride and those who have placed their faith in him will be able to participate in the marriage supper of the lamb. This wedding feast with, with the groom who has come to, to prepare his bride for himself, right? To clothe her in white, in purity, in, in radiance, right, to redeem her for himself, right? And we see the stark contrast of what the world has chased after. They've chased, her, chased after all these things that promise fulfillment and hope, but they left them empty. But those who turn to Christ, joy forever in this forever marriage to the Lamb. Hallelujah and amen, right? But the last thing I want you to see and to think about with me is what that marriage is gonna look like. And right, I hope you've seen it. I hope I've given you a clear enough picture that there really leaves no doubt to see the story of God that starts in creation, this covenant of marriage, right? How Israel was called to faithfulness within that marriage covenant, how they wandered from it. That covenant was broken, right? They broke that covenant. God divorced them, but yet he brought them back to himself and through the king that would sit on the throne of David, King Jesus, because he came first as a suffering servant to die for those who were desolate, to those who were, who were shamed, to those who were cast out, to those who had been forgotten and, and cast away. He, the suffering servant, the King Jesus came the first time to suffer and die, to pay the price, to redeem his bride to himself. So that the seed of Abraham, right, that would come, right, that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. Now, through King Jesus, this seed of Abraham who came now, he offers this relationship with himself through his blood that is to be likened to this incredible marriage relationship where he says, I will be your bridegroom. I will provide for your every need. I will be faithful to you. I will love you like no one else can love you. I will protect you like no one else can protect you. And all I ask is that you would respond in faith and confess me as Lord. And I will enter into this unconditional covenant relationship with you, not by your works, not by what you bring, but because I have accomplished everything to make this marriage. That is what is ours, church, right? And we're just in this stage where we are now waiting for what 
we see in Revelation as the consummation, right? The fulfillment of this marriage. And oh my goodness, what a day it will be. And I think there's passages all through scripture that show us, give us a taste of what it's going to be like. So I've given you some here, right? First Revelation 19, right? This is what we have to look forward to, right? Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's us. What's that going to be like? Well, it's going to be like what it says in Matthew 22, verse 2. It's going to be like a king whose resources were limitless and whose love for his son was unbounded. And he prepared a lavish wedding feast for the beloved son so at long last he could come and marry his betrothed. That day's coming. It's going to be like those wise virgins in Matthew 25 who had made preparation and they had kept themselves pure, hearing the long-anticipated shout, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. You know that language that we read that talks about when Christ returns, there's going to be the sound of the trumpet, right? And then Christ is going to come and the dead in Christ will come with him, right? And those who remain, right? We, we've got this incredible picture. Guys, did you know that's wedding imagery in the old testament in israel when the bridegroom would leave his home in the village to go and get his wife to go and get his bride he would start out on the journey right and the town would fall in line behind him and follow him to the bride's home and there would be trumpets playing there would be this incredible parade and celebration as the bridegroom goes to get his bride Jesus uses that language to say, when I come back, I'm coming like that bridegroom and I am coming for you. It's gonna be like that. John chapter two, it's gonna be like the best wine from water. Jesus at the wedding, there, there, that's not insignificant that Jesus was at a wedding and he turned the water into the best wine. That marriage is gonna be like the best Revelation 19, it's going to be like a bride clothed in fine white linen representing the righteous act of the saints. Isaiah 62, like Yahweh delighting in his people as a husband delights in his bride. Like Genesis 1 and 2, it's going to be like Adam and Eve in the garden but before sin, but even better than that. Like Song of Solomon 4, like the king's poetic expression of love for his beautiful bride. Like we see in Exodus in, Lever in Revelation, like these liberated slaves singing the songs of freedom, these songs of the sea. Like Hebrews 9, like the high priest entering the Holy of Holies on that great day where he comes in and he pours that blood of atonement. He brings that blood, his blood, where there is now no need for any other blood to be shed. He comes, right? He sheds his blood so that there is never a need again. He pays the price. Just like Hosea paid the price to get Gomer back. Christ came to pay the price to get us back. So he could unite himself to us forever. Like Revelation 21, like Jerusalem adorned as a bride for the wedding day. Song of Solomon 3 says that King Solomon, as he's approaching his wedding, he's joyfully wearing the crown with which his mother crowned him because he's in joy waiting to marry his bride. It's how Christ feels. It's how scripture wants us to understand Christ coming for his bride, that he longs for the day when he can return to bring us to himself where we can be together forever. How do I know that? I know that from a passage that we all know by heart where Jesus tells his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to what? Prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you what? That's wedding language. He's the bridegroom who's gone away. Why did he go away? To prepare a home. Who's the home for? For his bride. It's for us. 
Right? We live every day in anticipation that this groom is going to come to bring us to himself. And just like we read in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, and in Hosea, it is going to be this, this relationship where he says, I am going to delight in you. You are going to be the delight of my eye. I love you. You are going to be radiant like a fine jewel, right? You are going to be like the finest jewels and the most beautiful, brilliant, white purity. Not because it's you, but because of what I did for you. And nothing can take that away from you. Marriage, it runs the entire course of Scripture. From the Garden of Eden to this very day when each day we wait in anticipation of the bridegroom coming back to get us. So how are we going to live, right? We got to apply it. So that's what I want to send you away with tonight. As the bride, those who have placed your faith in Jesus, how are you living in anticipation of that marriage supper of the Lamb? Are you living faithfully? Are you living in expectation that he's coming? And oh, you wanna live in a way that just shows you've been waiting, you're ready. You long for that day. You wanna be found about the things that you know would bring him joy. Those are the things you wanna be found doing when he comes. Right? Not because the marriage is dependent upon it. No, he's paid the price. You want to do it out of love because he's already paid the price. Doesn't that make this imagery of the gospel so much richer when we even see this thread running through it of him as the bridegroom and us as the bride? Let me pray for you and we got to go. God, thank you so much for this night. God, thank you for this thread that we could trace today that just shows your heart above all else. It shows your, the depths of your love and compassion. God, that as your word says, you would not just take our sin, but you would become sin so that you could clothe us in your righteousness. God, this picture of this perfect, beautiful, pure wedding gown, you could clothe us in your righteousness. Why? So that you could bring us to yourself in a covenant relationship that cannot be broken because you were the author of it. You have instituted it and you have paid the price for it and now we get to enjoy the blessings of it. Not because of us, but because of you. God, help us to live as a bride who understands what you have done. And we long for the day when you will come to bring us to that place that you have prepared for us so that we could dwell with you forever. And until that day, may we be found faithful, sharing that incredible message of the gospel with as many people as will listen. For your glory and for your name, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.